relationships. And I want to use the example of little Raquel. So little Raquel was in grade school and she had a group of girls there that she wanted to be accepted by. She wanted to impress them uh, because she wanted to be a part of their group, which any kid wants to be a part of a group at school. So this was a normal desire that she had. She didn't know what to do to get these girls to really like her, to get them to pay attention to her or to respect her in any way. And so she tried a few things. Uh, she started baking cookies and she would bring the cookies to share with the girls. And a lot of times the girls weren't necessarily mean about it, but they would just like take the cookies and be like, oh, thanks. And it wouldn't like lead to a friendship. And when she went home and kind of told her mom that the, that what she tried didn't work, her mom said, Raquel, you're enough. And Raquel had no idea what her mom was talking about or why that was relevant to the fact that she had just spent all this time baking these cookies. So she tried something different. She tried cupcakes. She brought the cupcakes to school and she shared them with the girls and the girls were indifferent. Some of them didn't eat the cupcakes for various reasons. And sure enough, again, Raquel found that she wasn't able to formulate a relationship with these girls uh, based on making cupcakes. And she told her mom, you know, I bake, the, bake, I bake these cupcakes and these girls still, they don't even like notice me. And her mom said, Raquel, you're enough. And again, Raquel didn't understand what the value or the point of that piece of advice was, you're enough. All she knew is that she's trying to get in with this group. So eventually Raquel just gave up from baking things, from bringing gifts and presents and, and all of that. And uh, she was at school uh, just kind of ignoring the girls because she just kind of felt like it was her only way of coping emotionally. And um, it was when the teacher said that they were going to play a memory game. And this is Raquel's like specialty. And so they started playing this memory card game and Raquel is just doing really great. And all of a sudden the girl started to pay attention to her. Uh, sure enough, she was able to strike up some relationships, some friendships some relationships with these girls. And she went home, told her mom, mom, it's so crazy. Everything changed. And it's like all that time I was trying to bring gifts and bring presents and like please them. But it was like just me being myself. And then it all clicked. I'm enough. That's what her mom was trying to tell her. That's why her mom kept saying, Raquel, you are enough. But for many complex trauma survivors, we didn't have a mom like Raquel had who told us that we were enough. We may have had a mom who told us just the opposite. <laughs> You're not enough. You're not good enough. You're not doing good enough. You need to do more. You need to be more. I'm not satisfied. So if you had a difficult to please mom, uh, that can lead you to having a, a troublesome relationship with relationships. So now when it comes time for you to go out, and for you to meet people and for you to uh, to form to form bonds and connections in the outside world, because things in your family of origin were difficult, it can make it difficult for you going out into the outside world. Some of us were hurt very, very deeply, very badly by the abuse or by the neglect of our parents, of our caregivers or our brothers and sisters. in our family of origin. We may have internalized the mistreatment and said to ourselves, well, if my mom doesn't love me, then no one can love me. Can you see how that's a detrimental frame? If my mom doesn't love me, then no one can love me. And with a thought process like that, it can cause us to give up entirely on finding and formulating relationships that are meaningful that are beneficial on a mutual level. For some complex trauma survivors, it wasn't the physical abuse, but it was the emotional abuse that really uh, prevents them from being able to easily make relationships and make connections in the future. Uh, you see now they feel so worthless 
as a result of the way they were treated. They actually feel like they are worthless and struggling with worthlessness is not helping them to be able to formulate more close connections. Struggling with self-esteem is not helping them to be able to formulate close connections. Now they have social anxiety. Maybe they were bullied in school and that's not helping them to be able to formulate close connect, close connections now. If they do get into a relationship, they may have a, a troublesome relationship with the relationship, meaning that they love this other person, but that love that they feel makes them feel out of control, which then makes them not trust the other person. And so in the feelings of distrust for the other person, they start to do things that would be considered weird under normal scrutiny, uh, such as um, sabotaging the relationship, such as accusing their partner of things that they have no proof of, like, oh, you cheated or you're, or you have, you're perverted or you're this or you're that. And in reality, their partner has never done anything to deserve necessarily being called that or seen that way. But what's really at play here? Well, for the trauma survivor, they're saying that, they're lashing out, they're doing that because they're scared they're afraid of being hurt again and that fear that they have that they're going to be hurt that that fear of vulnerability that's causing them to act out in such a way that's actually sabotaging the relationship one man would constantly accuse his girlfriend of cheating even though she wasn't cheating he would constantly accuse her i know you're cheating i know you're texting some guy i know i know you're doing something he was afraid. This was a maladaptive way of him processing and handling his fears and, and, and his fear that he would be left or that he would be cheated on. But what do you think? Is that a healthy way of handling the situation? Well, of course not. Because if we keep accusing someone of doing something that they're not even necessarily guilty of, then you are really exhausting them. You're making them feel untrusted, which makes them feel unloved. And nothing creates the formula for the very thing that you fear, like making your spouse feel unloved. There's no better way to, to assist them in the potential that they would do something like cheat. So our very efforts to try to control things in a relationship can backfire. And so complex trauma survivors are almost always controlling on, on some level in their relationships. They're almost always controlling. So I want you to think about yourself as an example. Now, you may not be controlling the same way the narcissist is controlling in relationships in a very direct or overt way of trying to uh, tell someone where they can go, what they can do, or controlling the finances. Uh, but you may find yourself being controlling in a more roundabout sort of covert manner, saying things to get a reaction out of your spouse is an example of control. Saying things to make your spouse uh, reassure you rather than just asking directly for the reassurance is, is a form of control. People pleasing so that we're creating a false picture of how we really feel or what we're really thinking, it can be a form of control. It's manipulation, right? And so we have to look, take a long, hard look at ourselves as to why we may be having trouble with relationships. Complex trauma survivors have trust issues. They have communication challenges. They have issues setting boundaries. They have concerns when it comes to intimacy, right? Does that sound like you? For many trauma survivors, it can be about emotional regulation. So just the very idea of being in a relationship with someone is dysregulating. And then when they have an issue with you, then you don't want to talk about the issues because you don't want to feel dysregulated yourself. And so you try to get out of having deep conversations with your mate. Uh, I'm feeling really tired. Can we talk about this later? Oh, but really, it's just that you don't want to deal with your emotions. And maybe you just don't even know what you really are feeling. And that 
perplexing situation makes you not ideal in a relationship. You're not being an ideal person to have a relationship with. On the other hand, you could be someone who's constantly trying to bring it back to, I need more reassurance. I need more reassurance. I need more reassurance. And so you're not ever allowing your your spouse to just be. They have to be constantly reassuring you. Or maybe you're making them tiptoe around your triggers. No, no, don't say that. Don't do that. All right. If we have difficulty with emotional regulation, we may overreact. So we find ourselves yelling, right? Trauma survivors are often attracted to narcissists and abusive persons. Trauma survivors are often attracted to narcissists. Now, why is that? Well, for one, you're attracting them because... If you are walking into relationships exhibiting a lack of self-esteem, if you're exhibiting a lack of self-confidence, a lack of self-worth, then you look like the perfect target for the narcissist. That's why you keep finding them so easily. They're finding you. When you manifest a lack of communication skills, a lack of ability to articulate your emotions, that's exactly what the narcissist is looking for. Easy prey. That means you don't have good assertiveness and good boundary setting skills. That's just what the nar- that's just what the narcissists and the abusers are looking for. You see, that's why you keep ending up in a relationship with narcissists because they see that you don't enforce boundaries really well. And then when you do try to enforce boundaries, when they push, they push, 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 make you feel uncomfortable. You fold. Hmm. Okay. Oh, perfect. That's a perfect abuse victim. Someone who folds. Yeah, perfect. So really, we need to learn to have good boundaries, good assertiveness, high self-worth, high self-esteem in order to be able to stop attracting the very people that are going to harm us in these relationships. Another issue is that because we're in scarcity mindset with our low self-worth, I'll never find anyone. There's probably no one who will love me. Well, then you just take the first person who comes along. Now the first guy with a good smile or shows a little charm and you go, I never thought this was possible. And you come unglued. And then with extreme thinking, you idealize the person. So now you just fantasize about how you think they would possibly maybe be. You don't even know them that well. So you put them up on a pedestal. Now you're idealizing, idealizing, idealizing. Oh my God, they're so amazing. I can't believe I found someone in the world that would love me. I'm an unlovable creature. All because you're in desperation, deprivation mindset. Now you're susceptible to abuse because you're taking the first person to come along instead of taking your time and meeting lots of people. You didn't think it was going to be possible for you to meet anyone. So, oh my God. All right. Individuals with complex trauma may have maladaptive coping mechanisms such as avoidance or emotional numbing, which interferes with our ability to engage authentically in relationships. And so we're wearing a mask and wearing a mask can at best get you something that's a good fit for your mask, but it doesn't get you a relationship that's a good fit for you. So now you end up in a relationship with someone you don't even like that much because it fit your mask, but it doesn't fit you. And if we don't have good conflict resolution skills, we're definitely not going to be very effective in a relationship. Because the reality is conflicts are an inevitability of a relationship. But you didn't think of that when you were doing all your idealization of this fantasy version of this partner that you're going into this relationship with and and thinking about how amazing it was going to be. You're like, how are we going to have conflict? He loves me. This is an impossibility already. If we have a conflict, I'll just people, please. That's what I normally do. (laughs) And that's not really sustainable, is it? not sustainable to be in a relationship where you don't hold the other person accountable for anything 
It's not sustainable to be in a relationship where you're not real, you're not authentic, you're not speaking up for your needs, you're not advocating for what you want and desire. It's not sustainable to be in a relationship where you have to compromise all the live long day. And now that you have chosen a narcissist, your narcissist has one aim. And their aim is to get you, is to prove to you and the rest of the universe that you are an inferior human. That is the narcissist's aim. The narcissist's aim with you, the reason they are here, is they want to prove to you that you are an inferior human. And how are they going to do that, seeing how there's no such thing as inferior humans? Oh, well, yeah, that's why it will never end until you're dead. Doesn't ever end. Until they're gone, and you're, they're not in your life, or you're dead. You will have autoimmune diseases if you stick around with the narcissist. You will develop autoimmune disorders, and you will be in the hospital. That's a guarantee. If you can make it past the emotional illness, that will cause you to become suicidal. This is life or death. Man, no wonder we're having trouble with relationships. Now we're in a situation where we're about to lose our very life, our very soul. Our body is broken down because we started off with all the wrong tools to be able to make a relationship work. Just so you know, for your notes, the narcissist's aim is to prove that you are an inferior human to them, which is impossible, but they're still going to try. <laughs> and so the way that they're going to do that is to get you to act in a way that is morally inferior, that is physically inferior, to get you to appear to be uh, inferior in intelligence. How, how do they do that? Well, the best way to do that is to manipulate your emotions so that they can cause you to feel constant distress and destabilization, and they can break you down over time. And so that's what most narcissists go for. They go for the entire obliteration of your worth and your soul. Does that make sense? Because remember what they're trying to do, they're trying to prove they're, they're a superior person. Well, but don't they love me? I mean, yeah, <laughs> they love having someone that they can prove is inferior to them. So sure, if you call that love, but I mean, if you're talking about like a superlative biblical type love, no, <laughs> no, they don't have that. That's not in their lexicon. What they do have is all types of techniques and tools to destabilize you. And so you keep trying to trust them or fix something with them or get it to work when you're hearing their words, you're listening to their words, you're ingesting poison. That's all just poisonous for yourself. It's poisonous for your being. And as a result, you end up in like a poison victim in the hospital. And that, and that, where we haven't even gotten to the physical abuse, right? So the narcissist's greatest hope is that they can trigger you into doing something that is called reactive abuse, which is where you will attempt to defend yourself, but you will do it in an imbalanced way because you're human and you've been broken down over years of abuse. They will make you try to re or they'll try to get you to reactively abuse them. This is the sweet spot for the narcissist. Pay attention. Why does the narcissist want you to reactively abuse them? Because then you look inferior. You see, never mind the years of abuse and pinpricking and all the little techniques and tools that they've used against you. They just need the one time, the one time that you snap and you hit them or you get angry and you start breaking things or you start yelling or you say something mean. That one time that you lose it, that's all they need. so that they can catch you live and in action. 
and they sit there with that that look on their face, that smirk. You ever notice when you finally lose it with the narcissist? They have that look of pure peace and satisfaction. Just a smug little ugly look on their face. Right? And what and what was all that about? Because they want to prove that you're an inferior human. That's their goal. That's the goal. Now, can you make a relationship work with someone whose goal is to prove you're an inferior human? It is not possible. I can save you so much time and energy. Everyone's like, well, can you teach me techniques so that I can deal with my narcissist? Or can you show me how to set boundaries? You're going to waste, you're going to waste your time. You're going to waste your time. You cannot make it work. You cannot have a relationship with a human that is trying to prove that you're an inferior human and that is happy to harm you in the process. That's not possible. The whole concept of a relationship is that it would be mutually beneficial. That's what a relationship is, right? It's a mutually beneficial arrangement. So you can't have a mutually beneficial arrangement with a person who is trying to prove that you're inferior, i.e. is trying to do everything to your detriment because detriment is the opposite of benefit. So therefore, it's not mutually beneficial. Is that clear? I need it to be crystal clear. It can't work. Everything you're trying to do in your head to make it work with your narcissistic dad, with your narcissistic mom, with your narcissistic uh, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, husband, wife, cousin, girlfriend, boyfriend, you cannot make the relationship work because as long as their goal remains the same, which is to prove that you're inferior, well, they do everything then to your detriment. That's not a relationship. That's the opposite of a relationship. That's an attack. You are under attack right now. You are under attack. So don't try to utilize relationship skills that I or anyone else teaches you in a narcissistic relationship. You need to use the skill of disconnection and just disconnect. There cannot, there cannot be a relationship with someone who wants to do things to your detriment. Just leave in all cases, in all cases. So what about if we do find someone that is halfway decent and we will, we do want to have a good relationship with them? Uh, now, how you know if someone's a decent person, you're looking for the four qualities of the higher self. Uh, use the acronym EPIC, E-P-I-C. You're looking for someone who's ethical. That means they're moral, powerful. That means they're in touch with their personal power. They're not in victim mentality. They take responsibility for their actions. Intelligent. Intelligent is wise. Take in knowledge and they apply what they know. And compassionate. Compassionate is love. It's the most important quality a human can have is love. Empathy. Compassion. Compassion. You must have compassion. And every person must exhibit very clear signs of compassion. You need all four of these qualities proven to you. In every interaction, you should see, oh, I see the ethics there. I see the personal power there. I see the intelligence there. I see the compassion there. In every interaction, it's a constant thing. A person should have a balance of that going on for themselves. And you should be working on that balance as well. Those are two balanced, healed individuals. When they're ethical, powerful, intelligent, compassionate, EPIC is your acronym for that. So that's what you're looking for if you want to see like, okay, how do I find somebody who's got the right qualities, look for those four. Okay. Now, if we're dealing with trust issues, what's the, what's the skill that we need to develop? Well, we have to change the belief that trust is a feeling, trust is an emotion, and that the other person is responsible for, for whether or not we trust them. That's incorrect. Trust is a feeling and someone else cannot earn your trust or 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 uh, or lose your trust because they have earned or lost it. What it is, is that trust is a choice on your part. Trust is the currency of a relationship. 
So trust is a choice and you decide if you give it to someone. Now, likely if you see based on their actions that they don't deserve your trust, then probably you won't give them the trust, but it's not based on deservedness. It's based on if it is a wise investment. So you give your trust based on if it is a wise investment. For instance, children don't always deserve your trust because children will lie, right? Because they're children and they're learning the world. But you're still going to give them your trust back after you counsel them and help them understand what they did wrong. You're going to restore the trust of the child despite the fact they don't deserve it. It's not about your feelings. It's about giving the person what they need because without trust, there's no relationship. Without trust, there's no relationship. So if you so if you need to make sure there's still a relationship with the person, like your minor children, then you need to restore trust. Sometimes this can happen with employees as well. An employee does something wrong. They've betrayed your trust. Well, after you talk to them and you counsel them and the discipline is, is instilled, then you may choose to give your trust back to the person. You understand? Trust is not about just the feeling. It's about this. It's a choice that you make in your wise mind. When you understand that, then you don't have to worry about, do I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't trust anyone. To, you will analyze every relationship and you will assign your trust and remove your trust at will based on intellectual analyzation. So you don't have to be afraid for relationships. You can handle that. You're capable. You can learn more. Romans and Oni YouTube Trust. YouTube Romans and Oni Trust. And you'll find an entire breakdown of trust, how to, how to handle that. If you have communication challenges, if you're experiencing communication challenges, what's the what's the tools we need to overcome that? Well, number one, we need to learn the skills of assertiveness. And we also need to learn the skills of evasion. How do we evade an argument? I have trainings on this also on YouTube, totally free. Roman Zanoni, how to evade an argument. Also one on or multiple on skills of assertiveness. Once we master evasion and assertiveness, then we have the, the communication skills to be able to handle conflict in every relationship, whether it's at work or in the home. Evasion, assertiveness, repeat, evade, assert, repeat, E-A-R, that's ear. So we call that the ear technique. Learn the skills of the ear technique. You're going to need this. You can avoid getting caught into a relationship. When your evasiveness skills are really good, even if it was a narcissist trying to get you in into, into, uh, into a, a fight, an argument, then you can avoid getting caught into that argument when you have very good skills of evasiveness. So you need to learn how to evade, how to assert yourself, how to set boundaries. Boundaries are the rules and limitations that we create to protect our resources. Boundaries are the rules and limitations that we create to protect our resources. You set your boundaries based on your own feelings. When you feel uncomfortable, you suddenly decide it's time to set a boundary. It's just like that. Is it that simple? It's very simple, actually. It's very simple. But it's hard to learn. So how do we do it? Well, we need practice. We need practice on how to set boundaries, how to assert boundaries, how to enforce boundaries. We need practice, practice. But boundaries, having good boundaries, being able to set them and assert them and enforce them, this makes you, dare I say, fearless when it comes to relationships. A very well boundaried, assertive person is not fearful of getting into a relationship. They can handle relationships just fine. To that regard, they're able to get into abundance mindset and secure attachment. Abundance mindset is understanding that there are many, many men and women in the world, and there are many, many good men and women in the world, as well as many, many bad ones, right? Ones that aren't going to be a good fit for us or could be potentially abusive, toxic. So understanding that, in order to meet your tribe, 
instead of globbing on to the first people that you've ever met, which are like your brother, sister, mom, dad, like, (gasps) humans, oh my God, I have to hold on to these humans and meet more people. I want you meeting 50 people, 50 people in a short amount of time, like within a year or two, just get out and meet 50 new people. In a year, you should meet 50 50 new people easily, easily. Meet a lot of people. Meet a lot of people. Now you're in a better position when you've made so many potential connections. You're in a much better position to pick and choose your friends. To pick and choose your You're so much in a better position when you've got multiple connections being made because you're meeting people all the time. Don't just... Hold on to the first human you ever met. Oh my God, mom, you have to stay in my life. She doesn't, if she doesn't love you properly, just let her go. We got we got billions on this earth, billions. And, and I'm telling you, because I've met thousands of people, majority are wide open for a connection. Majority of people are wide open. You just talk to them a little bit and they're, oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. And they'll talk right back. And that's how you know. You know they're not open for a connection because you talk to them and they don't talk back to you. <laughs> it's that simple. Like, hey, how about such, such and such? And they're just like, uh-huh, yeah. And they leave. Okay, well, I guess they're not open for a connection. No big deal. No big deal. Let the rejection come. The rejection's a good thing. Conflict within the relationship is a good thing too. It's only through conflict that things get resolved. It's only through conflict that things get resolved. Meaning uh, you smooth out a piece of wood with sandpaper. So it's the abrasiveness, the, the 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 conflict, the friction is actually a good thing to produce the smooth results. Your relationship is smoother when you confront issues right away. Your self-worth, your self-esteem, your self-confidence come from you. They don't come from being with someone else. So stop looking for it in someone else's eyes and start affirming it for yourself and then project it outward. And then you will see it reflected back at you, but don't look for your worth and your confidence from someone else. It needs to come from you, your belief and understanding of it.